passage in Romans this morning. And that may seem different than uh, John 7, you know, which is what we have been going through. And well, you know, you'd be right. There are some points there, though, that I think build upon what we studied last week. You know, last week we were continuing in our study through the gospel of John. We were looking at chapter 7, verses 1 through 24. And as we went through the passage, one thought we noted was that Jesus put an emphasis on the necessity to act upon his word. And in that chapter, we had read how the brothers of Jesus had gone up to the feast at Jerusalem and Jesus was coming later. And John tells us that at the feast, there was much debate going on regarding what to think of Jesus as we read in John chapter 7 verse 11 where it says and Jews sought him at the feast and said where is he and there was much complaining among the people concerning him and some said he's good others said no on the contrary he deceives the people however no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews you know no one knew how to judge as Jesus says later in the chapter no one knows how to judge with righteous judgment as Jesus pointed out in verse 24 all they knew to do was to judge by what they could see. And so they did not know how to receive the words which Jesus taught, even though he astounded them with the insight and authority with which he spoke. They questioned how Jesus could teach this way. So we read in John chapter 7, verse 16, that it says, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will... He shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. They were all wondering if Jesus actually was who and what he claimed to be. They were questioning whether he was good or bad, whether they should trust him or reject him. And Jesus said to them, if your will is to do the will of God, then take action and see for yourself if my words are true. He's challenging them. So what did Jesus tell them through his ministry? What does he tell them to do in regard to all those questions? Well, he says, apply my word to your life and see for yourself what I will do. He says, practice what I'm preaching. Apply it to your life. He says, obey my words. Apply it to your life. He says, repent of your sin. Take action upon what I'm telling you to do. He says, come to me. He says, cast your burdens upon me. He says, believe. And he says, believe in his forgiveness, his love, his words. And then go out and treat other people the way he treats you. And he says, if you do that, you will know from the inside knowledge that no one can take away. You will know his words are true. Because his teaching is in line with reality, it's truth, it is good doctrine. Now that's a principle that runs through, all through life. Like we talked about last week, you really learn by doing. Which means it's all theory until you actually do something with what you've learned and put knowledge into practice. Well, when you do what Jesus says, you begin to understand with a deep conviction that he actually knows what life is really about. He actually knows what he's talking about. And as a result, you also will learn to trust him. Now, this is the principle that James, the brother of Jesus, learned when he did come to believe. And he passed it on to us in his epistle, where he said in James 1.22, But be what? Be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word this one will be blessed in what he does like we talked about last week, James didn't know how to judge with righteous judgment until he came to believe more than just appearances, more than he could see and understand with his physical eye. Clearly, he learned application of theory, and we must too. We spent quite a bit of time last week discussing those thoughts. Well, 
Friday morning in our church staff meeting, we discussed a few things that made me recall these thoughts from last week's message. And we're going to talk this week about having the faith to begin doing. And we're going to look, like I said, at Romans chapter 12 this morning. So if you haven't turned there yet, open up there in your Bible. And we're going to look at Romans 12, verses 1 through 9. So if you're able, please stand with me, and we're going to read through our passage for today. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another." Having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. And God, as we look at this passage and we tie it all together, Lord, I pray you'd speak to our hearts, that you would build in us the measure of faith that you've bestowed upon us, and that we would be unafraid to take steps inside of what you have called us to do. May we honor you with our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Now, this, this whole doing thing, like we talked about last week, actually applying the Word of God to your life and do what He's saying for us to do, that doing thing can be scary because we can think, well, great, I'm going to be open to this whole doing thing and God's going to make me go to Africa or something. <laughs> you know, we can think that, and that may be, you never know, I went to Africa a few times. I loved going to Africa, but that's not the point. There's a a key aspect to this whole doing thing. Look at Romans 12, 3. Paul said, For I say through grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Paul's saying to everyone among you, that means to every believer, God has dealt each one a measure of faith. He's given us a measure of faith. The phrase for measure means everyone has received a portion, a limit, a due fit, and by implication, a limited portion of faith. All of us have been given faith in some way. Some more in certain areas, some more in others, some little. Why? Because God knows the faith that we can handle, and he knows the faith that we need. The thing about faith is that as we do, as we apply the word of God and we actually act upon what he's calling us to do, as we begin to exercise the faith we do have in certain area of life, well, faith grows. It becomes stronger. It becomes more sure. And it expands to other areas of your life as well. You, as a believer, were given a measure of faith when you came to believe, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, for faith is what salvation required. You placed your faith for your eternal salvation in Jesus Christ. So that means inherently. Paul's words are true. You were dealt a measure of faith. Now, for a Christian, the question becomes, what are you going to do with your measure of faith? In Matthew 25, Jesus told a parable about the three servants who were each given a measure of money, a certain amount of talents, talents being monetary units. To one servant, he gave five talents. One, he gave two talents. One, he gave one talent. To each, he gave a different measure. 
The one who received five talents worked with the amount he had been given and produced a greater return for his master. The one who received two talents likewise worked with the amount that he had been given and produced a great return for his master. But the one who received the one talent was scared to death and hid the talent in the ground and kept it there. Now when the master returned, Jesus tells us that the master settled accounts with his servants. And to the ones who did, the ones who exercised what was measured to them, well, they received praise and great reward from the master. The one servant who was afraid and hid what was given to him had to settle accounts with the master too. He dug up what was extended to him. And he brought it back to his master, gave it back to him, and then had the nerve to raise accusations against his master, blaming him for the lack of return. Didn't go over too well. And the master held the wicked servant to task for his rebellion and disobedience of heart. We, too, have been extended a great gift. And it is a reasonable service, not an unreasonable expectation, It is a reasonable service to use the measure of faith we have been given to produce a return for the one who gave us everything. Look at Romans chapter 12. The chapter begins with these words. Chapter 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is what? It is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now this therefore in verse 1 is pivotal to the whole of this letter to the Romans. Paul goes from all of the groundwork that he had built in the first 11 chapters of Romans, laying out all of the doctrine that is necessary for us to understand as Christians, to now revealing our duty and and telling us how we should respond to an understanding of the doctrine that Paul laid out. And Paul here begs us to respond, seeing all of God's great love towards us because of who we are in Christ, because of all we enjoy because of Christ. In light of all of that, he says, I beseech you, I beg you with all my heart because of all the mercies of God that I've laid out for you in the doctrine I've given you. Now, to summarize that doctrine, he told us about justification from guilt and the penalty of sin, which means God sees us as if we've never, ever sinned before because of the complete work of Jesus Christ. He tells us of adoption in Jesus and identification with Christ, that no longer are we strangers to God, but we are in his family. We've been adopted in. That we are placed under grace and no longer under the law. That God's giving of the Holy Spirit to live within us was designed to help us and to grow us. He told us of the promise of help no matter what we go through, whatever affliction we face. He gave us the assurance of a standing in God's election, a confidence of his coming glory, a confidence of no separation from the love of God, a confidence in God's continued faithfulness. And he's saying in light of all of this that I've just laid out for you, All of this mercy, the past, present, and future grace that he's going to show us, Paul begs us to give ourselves to God and exercise faith. And with that, Paul gives us the very foundation of Christian living. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Saying in response to all that God has done, the least we could do is present ourselves to God and allow him to transform us and renew our minds so that we can resist being conformed to the world. Which is one of the things I think is sorely lacking in the church today for the large part the church looks exactly like the world does the church is being conformed into the image of the culture of the day not into the image of jesus christ 
which is completely contrary to his instruction. But by being conformed to the image of Christ, it proves all that is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. And he calls for us to be a living sacrifice. Now, the thing about a sacrifice, when a sacrifice is placed on the altar, what condition is the sacrifice in? Well, a sacrifice is pretty much dead. <laughs> you know, a sacrifice to be placed on the altar live, well, the sacrifice generally gets up and goes, you know what, I'm going to go be with the rest of the sheep. I think I'll just get up and walk off the altar. No. The, the sacrifice placed on the altar, inherently, that sacrifice is dead. And Paul is telling us that this is the heart attitude with which we must live. He's calling to mind what he said in Romans chapter 6, which we don't have time to get into fully today. But there he told us, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. And now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. A living sacrifice. Knowing that we as Christians are no longer our own. We no longer are chained to sin and slaves to it. We now are required to present ourselves, to openly present our hearts, daily submitting to God with a willingness to die to our own will, our own ways, our own desires, and submit ourselves to His will, His ways, His desires, to be conformed into His image every day, exercising the measure of faith that we have been given to say, okay, God, what do you want in to do in and through me today? This is our reasonable service. And it is with that faith that humility and the love of God grows. And he transforms and renews and grows and tends and builds more faith. Now look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3 through 9. He said, For I say through grace given to me to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. So again, after telling us, begging us to present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice <coughs> and instructing us to not be conformed to this world but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Paul instructs us to do. To exercise faith by living out the spiritual gifts that God has given us. To function in the body of Christ. He says in verse 3, For I say, through grace given to me, to everyone who's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So after telling us the proper response to the amazing gift of grace that God has given us, and just before he's about to tell us about spiritual gifts, Paul points out there's one big thing. Don't get too big for your britches because it has nothing to do with you. Paul warns us to be humble. Don't be filled with pride. Don't think too highly of yourself, but be sober-minded. In other words, to see the truth about yourself and live in light of that truth. 
And living soberly inside of the truth about yourself also means living in the truth of all that God has done for you and don't put on the air of false humility and go, oh, woe's me, but live in the truth of being free through grace and justified through Jesus. For God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, meaning God has a use and a plan for all of us inside of his body. He has spiritual gifts for all of his children and a place and a use inside the church, all given through faith and used in proportion to our faith. And seeing these things as gifts from God means we recognize that it's his spirit working through us, not anything we muster up in and of ourselves, not an emotional thing, but a real thing, which means we have no basis for pride or superior opinion of ourselves anyway. He said in verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Corporately, the church as a whole makes up the body of Christ. The church here on earth is to be the conduit through which Jesus is made manifest to the world. And all of us in the individual churches make up the members of that body of Christ as a whole. And inside of our church, we make up the members of this portion of the body of Christ. Each church will have a unique calling and gifting. And in turn, each person will have a unique calling and gifting inside of the church they are planted in. We all have a different role to play in the function of the body as a whole and as an individual church. And we all have spiritual gifts given through the Holy Spirit that allows us to function as our part. There is no member of the body of Christ without purpose. Every single Christian has a role to perform in the individual churches and the body of Christ as a whole. He truly has given talents. He's given units of value to every believer. He's given a measure of faith. It says in verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Paul says that the gifts will differ according to the grace given us, according to the measure of faith. And he says, use them. According to the measure of faith you've been given, begin to do. Look at what Paul lists here. The first gift Paul speaks of in verse 6 is prophecy. It says, having the gifts differing according to the grace that's given us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, prophecy, that's one we could look at and go, oh, that's, that, that's a scary one. That means I've got to go on a street corner and condemn everybody and tell them all the things that are going to happen, just like the prophets in the Old Testament. Well, prophecy means more than foretelling Speaking the predictive. It also means forth-telling. That means accurately speaking the heart and mind of God, which may or may not include a predictive aspect, but will expound on the Word of God declaring truth. Expositional teaching is a method of forth-telling. And he says in verse 7, or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. Now prophecy declares truth. Ministry depicts truth. Jesus modeled this over and over again. First he would teach, then he would touch. He would teach truth and then touch people as an illustration of what he taught. Ministry simple, simply means serving others. He says he who, who teaches in teaching. Now a teacher defines truth. A prophet will tend to share sporadically. A teacher will share systematically. And it has the mind of instruction, teaching what God has instructed us to do. So those first three things all tie together closely as they declare, depict, and define truth and give a picture to us of the heart of God that he has towards us, which then ties very closely with the next one in verse 8. He who exhorts in exhortation. Exhortation is encouraging people to put into practice what they've been taught. 
And both teaching and exhortation are necessary for a healthy Christian life. Exhortation develops truth. And it's the kick in the pants to get put teaching into action. Those who are taught but not exhorted become fat sheep that only take in and never live out the Christian life. Those who are exhorted but not taught become excited and very active but have no depth or understanding of what all the activity is truly about and will burn out quickly or will easily work in ways contrary to the word of God. And you see a well-rounded purpose behind these gifts and the expounding of the word. Prophecy declares truth. Ministry depicts truth. Teaching defines truth. And exhortation develops truth. And these last few that Paul mentions here in Romans, well, they expand the work. He says in verse 8, he who gives with liberality. Giving expands the work. And those who have the gift of giving are told to do so with liberality, which is also translated as simplicity or singleness or bountifulness and with liberty. Free from pretense or pride, free from hypocrisy, and free of self-seeking intentions. It means giving with no strings attached. Well, I'm going to give, but my name better go on the building. You know, that's a string that's attached. I want to give to where God knows, you know. No pet project or demands or a specific direction, but giving to the Lord for him to use in a free and joyful manner. That's giving with a simplicity of heart. And liberty of the spirit. And that's one who understands that all he has is a gift from God anyway and is free to give it all back. And then he says, he who leads with diligence, he who leads or rules or superintends, who presides over to be a protector, a guardian, to give aid, to care for, to give attention to, one who can administrate. Those are definitions of one who leads, one who knows how to manage and direct something in a productive and inclusive way. It's knowing how to do things decently and in order. And we can see this exemplified in the life of Jesus just in the example of the feeding of the great multitudes when he would have them all sit down in groups of 50 in order that he could feed them efficiently. And those who have this gift are told to lead with diligence or earnestness and care. And then he says, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So if you're expanding the work with giving, do it generously. And in simplicity, if you're expanding the work by leading, do it diligently. And if you're expanding the work by showing mercy, do it cheerfully. These gifts of giving, of leadership, of mercy, all put hands and feet to the truths that are gained and learned through prophecy and teaching and ministry and exhortation. It all fits together. It's all used in proportion to the measure of the faith that you've been given wherever you fit in there. Then in verse 9, we read, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. You know, love with hypocrisy is not real love at all. But true love is not jealous of someone else's gifts, someone else's calling. True love is not trying to get your own way through machinations. We're to hate evil and cling to what's good. And in the church, this is critical for unity. Paul says this another way in 1 Corinthians 12 and on into uh, 1 Corinthians 13. He said, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. 
For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. You know, all those things in exercising faith, the gifts that we've been had, you know, have been given the measure of faith that's been bestowed upon us. If we do without love, then we may as well not do it at all. The spiritual gifts we receive from the Holy Spirit that help to build us and sustain and grow a body of believers, they're great, they're nice, but all of that without love is worthless. All the gifts will eventually be fulfilled in the day we enter into the presence of the Lord and cross from seeing as through a mirror dimly into seeing full. When we go from being a child to seeing as a man. But in the here and now, we are called to be and to do all that we are gifted to do in this Christian walk. Act it out in love and because of love and because of the love we have received and exampled to others by acting out our part in love. Love is what gives us a willingness to use the measure of faith that we've been given. Our love for God. And out of that should flow our love for other people. And as your love for God grows, your willingness, your compulsion to use the measure of faith that you've been given will grow too. Which in turn grows your faith. You know, when you open yourself up to be used by the Lord, you're going to find that he's gifted you in ways and for things you never imagined you'd do. I had no aspirations to be a pastor. I was happy in business. The Lord called me out of that to be in, go into ministry. But when you answer what he's calling you to do, that alone allows you to praise him and recognize his hand in your life. Now one other thing, all this done in love also means we're not allowed to look down on those who don't share the same gift as you. Now certain things are obvious to ones who are gifted in specific areas of ministry. One who has the gift of giving can see a need in the church and give toward it and wonder why, why does no one else give? Why doesn't anyone else give? One who leads and is capable of administrating something really well may wonder at ones who have no idea how to plan their way out of the hallway. Ones who have the gift of mercy may be highly insulted that others pass by one with a need or one who's hurting. Or why didn't you think to go visit that person in the hospital? I confess, mercy is one that isn't necessarily in my natural giftings. I usually think of visiting someone in the hospital after they got home and went, yeah, you know, I probably should have gone visit them. Which makes me really rejoice when I think of that while it's going on because then I know it's the Lord, it wasn't me. You know what I mean? But regardless of the what, ones who are gifted in one area may be weaker in another. That doesn't make the one who does not have the same gift of you as you a loser, nor does it make you better. It makes you a different part of the body, and all of it's necessary. It doesn't mean that everyone should have the same gifting, or maybe they're not even really a Christian. All it means is that some are gifted in one area while another is gifted in another. And it makes us complete when we're doing it together. All these things have been given, as we are told, with a measure of faith. So that together we make a complete body. A hand is not required to be a foot, to be valuable. Don't look down on one who doesn't notice the same needs that you notice. Rejoice in being used by the Lord in the area that he has given you and prefer each other in love. You know, Paul in Ephesians 4 begins in verse 1 by the, similarly that he did in Romans 12. He begins it with a therefore and to beseech, just like in Romans 12. And again, he was talking of the amazing gift of the grace of God and he spoke of how it's been worked out in his life. And because of the grace of God, he begs the church in Ephesus, in chapter 4, verse, verse 1, he begs the church in Ephesus to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, 
with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay, that ending is kind of a wow for me. Because think about this. In Romans, Paul told us that God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. That we've been given faith commensurate with what we can handle or with what God saw fit. And that our faith can grow as we exercise faith. Faith has been given to us in that measure. In a way that God knew we could handle. As we use that gift, as we exercise it, it grows. We become bolder and stronger. We can act with love more. But Paul in Ephesians 7 says, Grace was given us according to the measure of Christ's gift. His gift is absolute and complete sacrifice for us. His gift is absolute and complete forgiveness of us. His gift is absolute and complete giving him of, of himself to us. All so that he can absolutely and completely work in us and through us. Faith grows, but grace is complete. That's a wow to me. God's given us faith that we can see grow as we just work with Him, join with Him, as we lay ourselves before Him, as we actually do. But inside of that, we gain a greater understanding of the completion of grace. That there's no other grace you have to earn. There's no more favor you could ever find from God. His forgiveness of you is absolute and complete. And so, because of that, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called... And exercise your measure of faith. And that's where it all goes back to. Romans 12, verse 3. God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So what does God expect from every believer? Well, you've been dealt a measure of faith. In complete grace. So exercise grace with each other. <laughs> as we're all growing our faith. And for that faith to grow, you must do you may have more faith in one area than you do another. But if you do with the measure of the faith you have, you're going to see faith grow. For as we read in Romans 12, 6, the exhortation is to do in proportion to the faith that you've been given. Don't try to be something you're not. But do not be afraid to act upon what you have been given. In other words, if you've been given faith to prophesy, then do it with the faith that you have. God's not expecting you to go act like Elijah or Isa, Isaiah or Ezekiel. He's expecting you to act like you inside of the gifting he's given you. If he's given you the call to minister, then do it with the faith that you have. If he's given you a call to teach, then do it with the faith that you have. Exhortation, do it with the faith that you have. Giving with the faith that you have. Leading with the faith that you have. Showing mercy with the faith that you have. For that's the starting point for all of us. And as you do, as you act upon the faith that he has given you, your faith will grow. John seven seventeen said, If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Jesus said to them, If your will is to do the will of God. Then take action and see for yourself if my words are true. Test me. We're going to close with that thought. Test me. Try me. Did God say that directly anywhere in the Bible? Well, he did. In the book of Malachi, God spoke regarding many things the people were doing that showed the condition of their heart toward him. He called them out. For saying that his law was unloving. He called them out because they were bringing sick and blemished animals to offer as sacrifices. He called them out because they were divorcing their wives, shamefully trading them in for younger models. 
He called them out because they were neglecting to give tithes and offerings to God, holding back from him and showing that their material goods had true hold of their heart and that God did not. And inside of that, they were accusing God of being unjust and unloving. Well, as God answered them and rebuked them for the condition of their heart, he said this in Malachi 3.10. He said, bring all Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out on you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. You know, God was dealing with one of the major strongholds that had a grip on their heart. Money. Their lack of willingness to give to support the ministry that tended to them because of fear and a lack of faith. Now, I know this is Old Testament, and many consider tithing to be a rule under the law that we as Christians are free from. But under the New Covenant, are we under a similar command to tithe? Well, the New Testament nowhere specifically commands tithing. But in Luke 11.42, Jesus certainly does speak of it in a positive light if it's done with the right heart. It's also important to understand that tithing is not a principle that depends on the law of Moses. It's not an issue of the law. Because Hebrews 7, 5 through 9 explains that tithing was practiced and honored by God long before the law of Moses. What the New Testament does speak with great clarity on is the principle of giving. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4 makes it clear that our giving must be periodic, done at regular intervals, planned, that we're to think of in advance towards our giving, that is proportional giving in proportion to our blessings, and that it's private, that it's not done to make us known as generous givers. As well, 2 Corinthians 9 tells us that giving must be generous, giving more rather than less. It must be freely given, not done out of guilt or manipulation, and it must be given cheerfully, happily, and with rejoicing in what God has done for us. All God is after, he doesn't need your money. What he wants is your heart. To know that your possessions do not have a grip on you. So if the question of our heart is, how little can I give and still please God, then our heart isn't in the right place at all. Which means giving and financial management are spiritual issues, not only financial issues. Now, all that to say this. It's really hard to find anything comparable to Malachi 3.10 where God says, try me. The phrase means examine me, test me scrutinize me, prove me, make a trial of me. It's hard to find anything in Scripture comparable to this passage, but God is saying, release that which has such a grip on your heart and step out in faith and test me and see if my word is not true. And yes, God is speaking specifically of finances there. And I I expounded upon that to show you the heart that he was looking at. But the whole point that God is saying is, have faith in me. Try me. And see if my promises are not true. And that same principle is true for whatever grips your heart in fear. It is true. The whole point he's saying is just test me. God has given you a measure of faith. And whatever aspect of faith he has given you. And faith will grow as you do. So whatever that faith is that he's given you, whatever measure it is, try him. Test him. Step out in proportion to the measure of faith that you've been given and see if his promises are not true. You will see the measure of your faith grow each time you're willing to do that in whatever specific area he sets before you. That's the principle of it. Each one of us has been given a measure of faith. Jesus is saying in John 7, just do it. Sounds like Nike, doesn't it? (laughs) But he's saying, just do it. Test me. Try me. You want to know if my words are true? Put them to the test. Do what I'm telling you to do. Act on the things I'm telling you to act upon. Apply them to your lives. And as you do that, you're going to find, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, and your faith is going to grow. So in those other areas that have a grip on your heart that you don't have much faith in yet, 
you'll grow to have the faith in those areas as well. So that when the Lord comes back, whatever talent he's given you, you won't have to dig it up from beneath the ground and say, well, it's your fault it didn't grow. But you'll be like the one that may have been given a lot or the one that may have been given a little. But have a return ready for your Savior because you were willing to just step out in faith with him and go, God, what do you want me to do today? How about I listen to you today? How about you show me who it is you want me to minister to today? Give me someone to pray with today. And just watch your faith grow. Lord, thank you for your word. And God, I pray that you would teach us what it is to seek you. Just to seek you first. To lay all the other things aside. To lay all those other things that have a grip on our heart. To be able to look at the measure of faith that you've given us, whether it's just a little bit or whether it's a lot. Oh Lord, may we use it and not hide it. But may we apply your word to our lives so that we can watch you grow. So we, our faith in you will grow. So that we will bear fruit for you and grow. Oh, may we be more like you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to stand, we're going to sing the last song.